Good evening. My name is David Marwell, and I'm very proud, especially this evening, to be the director of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Tonight, we commemorate the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II in Europe, VE Day. To give us a unique perspective on this milestone, we have invited Dr. Henry Kissinger to join us and we have asked Charlie Rose to elicit that perspective through a conversation with Dr. Kissinger. Brilliant scholar and teacher, confidant and advisor to presidents, author and authority, Nobel Prize winner and winner of the Bronze Star, Henry Kissinger was born in Germany in 1923 and immigrated to this country in 1938. He received his many degrees from Harvard University, where he also served on the faculty for many years. Dr. Kissinger's long and distinguished career in public service included his tenure as Secretary of State from 1973 to 1977. On the second floor of this museum, in our core exhibition, in the gallery that explores the world's response to Nazi aggression, stands a prized artifact. It is an honor roll from a synagogue in Washington Heights that lists members of its congregation who were serving in the armed forces during World War II. Nearly in the exact center of this honor roll of more than 100 names, sandwiched between Max Kaufman and Julius Klugman are the Kissinger brothers, Henry and Walter. Now, I'm not certain, but I would guess that for Henry Kissinger, even in the context of a life of significant accomplishment, respect, and power, that his most meaningful and proudest service was that which he performed as a soldier in the United States Army. A recent refugee from Hitler's terror Henry Kissinger served in intelligence units in Germany and in the last months of the war and in the occupation of Germany. He returned to Germany in the uniform of the country that provided him a new home and fought to defeat the enemy of his people and the enemy of that new home. We hope that this evening he will talk not only about his personal experience during World War II, but that he will also reflect on the impact of that greatest of conflicts on the 70 years that have passed since it ended. Seven decades that as statesman, he helped to shape, and as historian, he has special license to interpret. We are pleased beyond words and deeply honored to have Dr. Kissinger with us this evening. We are also deeply honored and pleased that Charlie Rose has agreed to interview him. And I just spoke with Charlie backstage, and he indicated that uh, Dr. Kissinger has been among, if not the most frequent guest on his show over the many years that Charlie has had the show. Charlie Rose spends more time in studios and on TV screens than perhaps anyone else in contemporary journalism. He is a contributor to 60 Minutes, the anchor of Charlie Rose and Charlie Rose The Week, and the co-anchor of CBS This Morning. His reputation for hard work and quality journalism was further burnished when he received both the Peabody and Emmy Awards in 2014. We are so grateful that he could find time in his tortured schedule to be with us this evening. And I'll say no more, but Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Charlie Rose and Henry Kissinger. Um, on behalf of Dr. Kissinger, thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me just say what an honor it is for me to be here. Um, it's hard to walk through this place and not be touched by what it is a remembrance of. Part of the reason we're here is to talk to Dr. Kissinger, about the early part of his life, there is no scholar, there is no one who studied his life that doesn't believe 
uh, that that experience through the war has shaped him. Uh, he went on to Harvard um, and extended his knowledge, but clearly there were things that he saw and learned and thought about that made a difference in how study added to a sense of the way the world had been, could be, and might possibly become. The idea of world order is a subject of his latest book, of which there have been many, and there's no better historian who writes any better than Henry does, and I say that because I read a lot of books um, and a lot of memoirs. Uh, it's been a remarkable life. He will be 92 years old, and I don't want to embarrass him, but I suspect he's pretty proud of the fact that uh, he is vigorous. He doesn't move as fast as he used to, but his mind operates perhaps even faster. Uh, he is today a man who people around the world are all seeking judgment and wisdom. And when you go see Henry, that's what you get, his judgment and his wisdom, nothing else. Uh, he is not an advocate. He is someone who has earned the right uh, through the experience he has uh, to have ideas that should be listened to. Many of us, including me, don't agree with everything that he believes in, uh, but you pay attention to it and, and you respect how serious he takes it. Just recently, uh, there was a huge amount of conversation about an article, an op-ed piece that he and George Shultz wrote about the Iranian nuclear talks. Um, journalists paid attention to it and a lot of other people paid attention to it. Uh, so it's deeply a great honor for me to once again share a platform with him and to talk about his life that many of us don't know about. Uh, we know about uh, his service to Governor Rockefeller, his service to uh, the country uh, as National Security Advisor and then as Secretary of State and the years after that. Um, nobody, certainly on the Republican side, who wants to be president doesn't come see him. Uh, and I did a show the other night with the UN Ambassador, Samantha Power, and she proudly talked that she seeks out his judgment and his wisdom. So um, I'm going to have a conversation mainly about issues. We won't get to lots of things that, that I often talk to him about. Uh, because this is a rare opportunity in this place to talk about um, who he is and how he became who he is. And I want to begin as early as I can, growing up in Germany, uh, but of good fortune to see what was happening and to arrive in New York. So with those introductory remarks, on behalf of this crowd, this audience, this place, thank you for coming. Well, I came here several times, at least once uh, with my mother. And of course, the history that for which this museum represents is part of my life as well. So it's a great honor to be asked here. And Charlie and I have been friends and talking to each other for decades. Literally. I knew him when he was on at two in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> he, he often and said. What difference five hours make? <laughs> he, he, often, he often says to me, or reminds me, reminds me, I knew you before you were Charlie Rose. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to tell you, I don't know how many people listen at two in the morning, but they're all fanatics. <laughs> and I used to get lots of letters. <coughs> Either that or they're drunk. <laughs> but they wrote letters. Let me start in Germany. Tell me about growing up in Kurth. What was it like for you? Um, give us a sense of what it was to be a young Henry Kissinger. That's what is, uh, it's a town of about 80,000 people, located right at the borders of Nuremberg, which was the largest city, 
And uh, in my early youth, it was, my father was a teacher at a gymnasium. And that means he was a state employee. And for Jews to be employed by the, the government was considered a very rare thing. That we're talking now about the late 1920s, early 30s. So I had a uh, sort of German Jewish middle class existence until the Nazis came. 33 or earlier? In 33. And, uh, and they began a systematic campaign of uh, segregation, delegitimization, uh, and for it was sort of permissible for Hitler youth kids to beat up Jewish kids. Uh, you couldn't go to German schools anymore, so, uh, but it was in the German system. They had a law that everybody was entitled to an education. So it was like separate and equal facilities we had in the South, so there was a Jewish school created uh, to which I went uh, for what? until we left, until I was 15. Did you have to, did you want to do things and it was necessary to try to um, not acknowledge that you were Jewish in order to do them, whether it had to do with sports <laughs> or anything like that? Now, in, in these relatively small towns, and my grandfather lived in a village, so it was known who the Jewish people were, and you, uh, and, and there were signs all over the place. Uh, Jews are, are not desired here, towns, some. So that produced the de facto segregation. And I think the only times that I violated it was to go to football games, to try to sneak into football Your games. Love of I had a great passion for soccer. Was there much talk about leaving before you left? Or did something happen and somebody, your father says? No, my father, you know, my father came from a li little village also. And for him, it was a spectacular career to come from a village and become a teacher in a, in a gymnasium with a title. And, so he was very reluctant to leave. My mother was felt that her children would never have an opportunity. Nobody thought that it was possible then that the Holocaust would take place. And so uh, my mother prevailed. And my father willingly went along, but he would not have taken the initiative to the extent. So it was your mother? My mother took the initiative, and she had an uncle in the United States who uh, sent her, what was called an affidavit, some assurance of support if we, uh, once, we, uh, once we got here. And so we left in September 38. Until then, there had been increasing restrictions, and life had become increasingly unpleasant. But it was not yet violent. But two months after we left was the so-called Kristallnacht, mm -hmm. when two all months. the synagogues were burned down. And uh, most Jewish men were sent to concentration camps. Uh, we missed that by the, literally two months. We arrived here in September 1938. And, uh, the Kristallnacht was in November, early November 38. And, uh, and then, of course, the Holocaust started. And, uh, 
many members of my family were, uh, became part of it. Uh, uh, Including your grandfather? My, no, my grandfather was very ill. And after, at the Kristallnacht, he was driven out of his house in that village that I described where my mother came from. And then he went to uh, the nearest city and he died of his illness. My grandmother died in the Holocaust. And three sisters of my father and all their families, and then at least 15 members altogether. And you arrived in New York? Yes. Lived in Queens? No, we lived in, uh, in Manhattan, in in, Manhattan. Uh, basically in Washington in, Heights. In Washington Heights. And you were then what? I was 15. 15. And then four years later, five years later, you're 19. Well, yes, I, I started working when I was 16. Thinking you would do what? Well, at that time I was working in a shaving brush factory. And I but didn't think I would have a huge career making shaving brushes. <laughs> 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 I see. But even, I went, even then, he was showing good sense. <laughs> I went to the night, night college. Right. Night high school first, and then night college, and studied accounting. That would and not have been the The world program. was spared a mediocre accountant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, then you got drafted. Yes in uh, 43. 43, you were 19. Right. And they sent you down to Spartanburg, South Carolina, or somewhere in South Carolina? Yes, Spartanburg, South Carolina. That must have been an awakening Camp right Croft. there. It was a different world. <laughs> <laughs> How was it different? Well, uh, the, uh, the draftees, of course, came from all over the country. Yeah. In Washington Heights, some, there was an article in a German newspaper after the war that called Washington Heights the Fourth Reich. The Fourth Reich, yes. Because uh, there was a preponderance of German Jewish immigrants, right. at least a very large number, and most of the people I associated with there. And then in the shaving brush factory, I, I was in contact mostly with Italian immigrants, or not, not Jewish, it was a different group. But in the army, I met, of course, a cross-section of Americans, and I finally wound up in the 84th Infantry Division, which was uh, composed of uh, it was called the Rail Splitter Division after Lincoln because most of its uh, uh, soldiers came from northern Illinois or southern Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of people. Uh, uh, so that is when, and there we did our training yeah. in Louisiana, where we got jungle training and then we were sent to the coldest winter that Europe had had in quite a while. Yeah. So let's pick that up. I mean, so you get drafted, you're naturalized as an American citizen. Yes. They had a sort of fast track. If they drafted you, they would naturalize you. Yes, but I had already, you needed five years of living here, so uh -huh. I was close to being eligible. So, so you go off to serve your country. You land in Normandy, what, a month after the invasion? Uh, about two months, but we, we landed at Omaha Beach, and. Uh, we still had to go into landing boats from the ship. I don't know how I did that, coming down the, uh, uh, the side of the ship, but we all got seasick coming in on these flat-bottomed boats, and when I think of the soldiers who had to land under fire in these conditions, it really uh, increased one's admiration even more. 
for those who landed on yes. December 7th. Yes, we landed, we came in about October, end of September. July, what, what, I forgot that. Yeah, July, December was Pearl Harbor. 44. Yeah. Uh, so, what happened then? Because the Battle of the Bulge and High Cola was going to be. No, we were first sent. Uh, uh, we were first sent to uh, to Holland right. at the port, of, really to Germany, at the border of Germany and the Netherlands. And my unit was assigned to another division for combat experience that was near Aachen in Germany. And then after the first period, I was pulled out of there and sent to the headquarters of the 84th Division to be uh, in the, to work in the G2 section, that's the intelligence section. But that's still only about three miles behind the front. So you, you went from being a rifleman to, to being counterintelligence. In, well, at first, it was not counterintelligence. At first, I was reading captured mail of Germans and interviewing prisoners. And then I was transferred three months later to counterintelligence. When did you meet a man who played enorm has enormous influence on you by the name of Kramer? Well, it was a... Uh, I met him when we were training with the... It, in Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. And uh, Kramer was uh, a German. He would wear he wore a monocle, wore riding boots. It was a ridiculous figure riding. <laughs> he, he was a private. Uh, he was a private. He was a private. He was a, uh, and luckily for him, uh, there were only two possibilities, that somebody would kill him or that he'd get promoted. <laughs> and, uh, and the general of the division dressed him up in German uniform and made him go and give speeches about what the war was about. And he spoke to my unit, the regiment to which I was assigned. And I did something that I don't think I've ever done before. I certainly have never done it before, and I don't remember that I ever did it since. I wrote him a letter how impressed I'd been by his speech. And uh, he was much older than I. I was, what, 20 at most then. And uh, so I got to know him. He invited me to, uh, to meet him. And when I and he probably contributed to my being assigned to the uh, headquarters, where we both worked in the G two section. His name was Fritz Kramer. Fritz Kramer. Yeah. There was a point in which he evidently, at some point, said to you, "Kissinger, you're a historian." No, he had two PhD degrees. He was about fifteen years or more older than I was. I don't know what he was doing in an infantry division to begin with. Uh, and uh, yes, he took an interest in what I should be reading, which was not the normal conversation among. Uh, well, but the story that I know, I mean, this actually part of what I know about this comes from, from some very good work by uh, my producer. But also, I had a conversation this afternoon because uh, I was doing an interview with Marco Rubio, and, and in the audience uh, was Neil Ferguson, who is writing, uh, finishing a two-part biography of Secretary Kissinger. And the first volume is going to be out in a month or two, I think. Yeah, September. And so Neil just happened to be there, and so we talked about it. And, and he told me, I said that Kramer is probably the most influential person you know, in your life early on. And I would say in this stage yeah. of my life, absolutely. Because he said two things. You're a historian. Yeah, he said, you know, forget about accounting. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was not a hard sell. <laughs> no. And he also said, you should go to Harvard. 
Yes. Well, he gave me a list of, of schools. Uh, the problem was that I didn't know anything about admissions policies, so yeah. I applied in April of the year that I wanted to go to school. <laughs> and uh, most of the, every school except Harvard, I must say, in effect, wrote back in effect saying, you must be kidding. Yeah. <laughs> or why don't you go back to City College? Yeah. Uh, but Harvard took me. And uh, so. Well, did he have something to do with that, you think? He wrote your letter of recommendation? He certainly wrote, me, wrote a letter of recommendation. And, um, but he was certainly extremely influential in my life. So he's got you in counterintelligence. So you're interviewing Nazi prisoners of war? Well, prisoners of war and, and suspected spies, uh, people who, uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans dressed, uh, had, had a unit that in American uniforms operated behind the American line because in the Battle of the Bulge, the front line disappeared for a few weeks. So for example, our division came into a town and there were German military policemen standing there because German tanks had already gone through the town and the military policemen were supposed to direct the infantry that was coming after them. And the next thing these MPs saw was an American infantry division rolling into town. So uh, it's in that period that uh, I, I, w I was assigned uh, to counterintelligence because of the, partly the belief of our general that I could tell a German by looking at it, <laughs> like a kind of police dog. <laughs> so I was sitting there at the door of the division headquarters, <laughs> looking at people coming in. And then there were certain questions that we had to ask, usually about baseball. You know, what do you do with two men on base and they count three and two? <laughs> Something you thought German. And what would they say? So, well, most of the, well, luckily no Germans in American uniform came in. <laughs> so the Americans knew it. More or less, if they didn't, it would be. But you had enormous power in one of the small towns that you were given control of. No. Then at the end of the war, when the war was over, over, the task of the counterintelligence people was to denazify, that is to, to get the people who had held the, any rank above a certain rank of Chrysler was the, okay. uh, could not hold any governmental office. And if they had had a higher rank, they were interned. And it was one of the jobs of counterintelligence to uh, collect this. And also, in the very first phase, to restore public services until military government could come in. And considering that I was barely 21, that did give me an enormous amount of responsibility. Uh, someone, uh, you have said, quote, I had absolute authority to arrest people. In the CIC, we had more power than even the military government. Well, but that's a question of timing. We came in with the combat units. Yeah. The military government came in after the combat units. So while the combat units were there, I mean, we were moving and we were, go, we were taking towns uh, in which we didn't, we didn't know who was who. And uh, at, right at the end of the war, the Germans had ordered, or Hitler had ordered to create guerrilla units. And then there were displaced persons and refugees and one situation, concentration camp. So that was our principal 
uh, responsibility to bring about enough orders so that the military, that the combat unit could exist there. And as soon as the combat unit went on to other things, then military government came in. So in that sense, being in a combat zone, we had more power than the military At government. At this time, did you know what the Nazis had done to your family? I knew, of course, that they had disappeared, that all my remaining family members. And when my division, the, when the 84th Division took Hanover at the outskirts of that town, there was a concentration camp that was a subdivision of the Bergen Belsen camp that had just a few thousand prisoners because they were a work camp. And Betzen Belsen is the one that Reagan went to. That who? Ronald Reagan. Uh, Reagan, yes. Uh, you know, and, uh, oh, maybe. Ella Vizella, yeah, I think. Anyway, it was. The Belton camp was about 30 miles away. And uh, one cannot imagine, I couldn't imagine, I don't think, it, well, some people in this room probably will be able to imagine. Well, tell us what it was and the amount how you of the degradation and the, uh, the reduction to, of human beings to a level. When, when I saw American movies afterwards with South concentration camps, I said, well, the prisoners looked a lot better fed in the movies than, than they were in, in the concentration camp. This is so that was a pretty severe experience. Here's a letter you wrote as a young man, speaking of Holocaust survivors. Concentration camps were not only mills of death, they were also testing grounds. Here men persisted and in a sense fought for survival with the stake always nothing less than one's life with the slightest slip of fatal error. Such was the filth, the compulsion, the debasement that a person had to be possessed of extraordinary powers, both psychic and of will, to even want to survive. The intellectuals, the idealists, the men of high morals had no chance. Having once made up one's mind to survive, it was a necessity to follow through with a singleness of purpose inconceivable to you sheltered people in the States. Such singleness of purpose broached no stopping in front of accepted steps of values. It had to disregard ordinary standards of mortality. One could only survive through lies, tricks, and by somehow acquiring food to fill one's belly. The weak and the old had no chance. That's how it looked to me. And that's how it was. Can you take me back to when you were there and what you and then what, well, what it was like. You know, I, I haven't made it a habit ever to talk about, about these things. Uh, and for people in this audience, they'll know what a shattering experience it was, knowing that many people I knew had gone through a comparable experience in the camps. But this was not an untypical, this was a typical camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, those prisoners were, they had trapped an SS man and they were trying to hurt him and they were too weak. Too weak. And uh, it, was, it was simply the reduction of human beings to a level of degradation that uh, that was uh, in, had been inconceivable. You obviously chose not to speak when I speak now because if ever to talk about it, this is the place to talk about it. Having said that, how do you think it has influenced you? Well, it showed what can happen to a country if it's most special elements are given free reign and uh, what can happen through uh, declaring, segregating people, declaring them uh, subhuman 
and the consistency with which it was carried out. Uh, we captured the man who was in charge of that camp because he stayed there. And he turned it over to us because he thought he'd now get his orders from somebody else. To him, that camp was a normal part of existence. What happened to him? I don't know what happened to him. He went probably to Woods. Uh, but you see, we moved on. This is with the distinction. But in the Bergen camp, which was the camp that was responsible for the whole region, that man, the commander of that, stayed behind. And he was hanged uh, six months later. He was one of the first war criminals that was tried. You stayed at being in counterintelligence for two years after the war ended. Well, I stayed, yes. Two years. Well, the war ended in July of 45. And I stayed about nine months in the area which then was assigned to me now, could and you have gone home then, or did you elect I to could stay? have gone home maybe 10 months earlier than I did. But Kramer, whom you mentioned before, was at, there was a European Command Intelligence School in Obamagal, and he and I got a, a, a civilian job as an instructor at the intelligence school for about eight months. So altogether, I stayed about a year longer. Looking at everything that we have talked about this evening so far, tell me what impact, how it has influenced, you think, you know, a man who went on to, you know, go to Harvard, become a distinguished professor, write lots of books about nuclear policy, about foreign policy, about diplomacy, about countries. Um, and as you have developed strategies, ideas about how the world works, what was the influence of this experience we have talked about? Well, there are two aspects to this experience. One is the experience of evil, of disorder, of the breakdown of uh, civilized discourse, and of the vulnerability of societies when that framework collapses. And then, of course, at the end of the war, one saw this immense suffering that uh, you've described, or that you've asked me to describe. But at the same time, there, be, there emerged the imperative of how are you going to rebuild it? And what are we going to do in order to prevent this from happening again? And how can you create an international system and within Germany a national system by which these tragedies could be avoided? So my, at first my duties and then my interests moved from understanding the nature of disorder, crisis, suffering, to how you can restore this and prevent it from happening again. And then it wasn't just my experiences. I, I started reading a lot. And so m many of the things I've written may have had their impetus in this period. But the content of it, I derived from other experiences as well. 
What was the big mistake after World War I that the world had to learn the lesson and not make after World War II? Well, first of all, World War I was a horrible mistake in the sense that here were nations that were living together in a reasonably orderly manner, going to, into a war that they thought would last six months, and then turning it into a mass slaughter so that the civilized structure of many societies was torn up and, and, and casualties were so enormous that, that faith in government as such uh, was destroyed. Then after the war, uh, the leaders who made the peace did not ask themselves the question of how the peace they were creating could be maintained. So they created a Germany, a, a settlement with Germany, which was too severe to be accepted, but too little aware of history, so that actually Germany's strategic position improved as a result of World War I. Before World War I, Germany was surrounded by big countries. After World War I, it was surrounded by a bunch of little countries, each of which were too weak to resist Germany by itself. And so the basis was created from which Hitler could, once, once Germany rearmed, Germany was in a strategically better position. But the statesmen of the world had not understood the lesson that you must have a, a concept of uh, the objective of your policy and not be, uh, not be swept away by the mood of a, uh, of a, uh, of a moment. And so when Hitler came into power, there was no framework within which they knew how to resist him. And he would make demands that at first seemed reasonable. Uh, and, uh, and, and within an amazingly short time, within, less, within five years, got into a position from which he could threaten all of the European countries. So the lesson to be learned is to understand what circumstances can become so irrevocable that you have to resist them at the beginning of, the, of their occurrence and not wait until they turn into a full-fledged uh, crisis. Who failed to recognize that? Who failed to recognize mm -hmm. it? Everybody. I think basically... Except the German resistance. Basically, the German, the uh, many Germans didn't recognize what, the full extent of what was going on, and in the surrounding countries, the war had, the World War One had taken such a toll that the reluctance to face another showdown was overwhelming, and uh, so, in a theory, it would have been very easy to resist Hitler. Uh, say 1936, when the first move he made was at the end of World War I, the territory beyond the Rhine in Germany was demilitarized. So the first move he did was to remilitarize that. Well, that sounds not unreasonable that you put military units in your own country. And so every year he kept escalating his demands. And the leaders were not looking, I mean, there were a few like Churchill who did see the consequences. But that was the basic dispute that was going on, whether, uh, whether Hitler could be brought to reason by making uh, concessions, or whether one was dealing with a phenomenon that was so uh, aggressive and evil that it had to be resisted immediately. Uh, that was the dispute between Churchill and Chamberlain. And Churchill was in the wilderness. Churchill and then was, was called uh, back to power after. Uh, well, but Churchill was uh, out of power, and he kept making warning speeches, and 
he had the reputation of being uh, a, a kind of troublemaker and ambitious. Uh, well, could another man have done what Hitler did, or did Hitler have some combination of evil and... Well, Hitler certainly had some maniacal uh, qualities. I mean, he, uh, he, he had, if you, if you look at, uh, the other day there was some kind of a youth program that showed his rise to power and where he entered a room to make a speech and the gestures he made to attract attention to himself. So he had a uniquely, a unique capacity of concentrated evil. Uh, and apparently a very spellbinding uh, effect on people uh, around him. I've asked German generals, what were you thinking? And they said, well, he'd look at you and, uh, he, uh, and you lost your judgment. So that was a special quality. But uh, a readjustment of the European situation had to take place because there were too many, there were as many people under foreign rule under the Versailles settlement as there had been before that is people, uh, Czechs living in Poland, the Poles living in Russia. So there was a tinderbox, but with more moderate leaders probably could have been brought to a, but to a conclusion without this outbreak. And when, when you look at Germany after the war and Conrad Adenauer and all that came after him all the way through to Angela Merkel, when you look at Japan, where they were, where they are, two bitter enemies and their friends, um, with differences on certain policies. When you look at Russia, which was an ally in the war, they just celebrated, uh, took note of the end of the war in Russia. The United States had no presence, nor did any other Western Europe. What are the challenges today in the concept of trying to figure out a way to avoid catastrophe. Not the rise of an Adolf Hitler, or perhaps. What's the kind of lessons we draw now to avoid um, disaster? Well, now, of course, the issue has become global. In Europe in the 1930s, Hitler was challenging a European system of order because much of the rest of the world was colonized. And uh, so now one has to bring together societies that have different histories and different cultures into some kind of a common system in which the weak cannot be overwhelmed by the strong, and in which everybody recognizes enough justice so that they don't want to overturn the system. But that's a huge assignment. And uh, so now the questions are, as China is rising, what kind of an international world will it live in and what can we do to keep it from disturbing it or to make it cooperate? Same question about Russia. The Middle East, of course, all of the existing systems have broken down. You have a revolution against governments. You have a conflict between ethnic groups. You have a variety of religions. Uh, and the borders that were established at the end of the First World War have lost their validity. So all these revolutions are going on simultaneously. And now weapons of mass destruction are being introduced into this situation. 
So the leadership that will be needed to bring this to a conclusion without catastrophe is vast. And one has to understand which nations can contribute and which cannot. So that's the paradox, for example, which we've discussed on your show, that on the one hand, we are in conflict with Russia over Ukraine. But on the other hand, it's probably the case that Russia and we have a common interest to prevent non-state organizations from arising in the uh, Middle East countries. Non-state organizations like ISIS and the others, which then project their efforts into the rest, uh, into other uh, countries, and which reject and demonstrably reject the accepted norms of morality. So one has to understand which elements can be helpful and to understand the nature of the challenge. And this is only the Middle East. You think the United States has abdicated its role? I think the United States has withdrawn too rapidly. Evidence. I think about evidence. What, what would you cite as evidence? Of, well, I would I mean, say. Are I, you talking about war with no, Afghanistan, I think, I think, Iraq, and well, Afghanistan, we, we or are you talking argue, about trying to have. We can argue whether we should have gone into Iraq or not. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, we, one can argue whether it was important to go into Iraq because of the accepted belief that they were working on. Uh, weapons of mass destruction, but whether trying to make them into a democratic society mm. was not beyond the uh, capacity of uh, the tolerance of, uh, of public opinion. Uh, but be that as it may, once we had created a relatively tolerable situation, uh, withdrawing so rapidly as we did in recent years, uh, accelerated the capacities of the various non-states. Okay, let me ask this in a tougher way. Um, you, you, look, the Saudi Arabia um, did not send, the king elected not to go. You can make too much of that or not enough uh, either way. But there have been a series of articles recently uh, because of the president inviting the Arab leaders to come here to talk about a common policy in the Middle East, uh, especially against ISIS and other terror organizations, al-Nusra and others, al-Qaeda. Um, and one article after another suggests somehow that those countries are less sure about America's commitment, America's relevance, America's role. I think that's true. You think they're true in making that judgment? I think that's a valid judgment, yes. But I tell you, I really, I mean, I don't want to get into that uh, controversial discussion here. Uh, but yes, I, 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 I think that is a correct judgment that the uh, Sunni Arab states are now dubious about the nature and extent of the American commitment. Uh, on behalf of this audience, we have, and I have kept you longer than we promised. I was supposed to stop at 8.45, 7.45. Forgive me. Um, And on behalf of you, I thank Dr. Kissinger for taking this evening to share a life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.